Chapter 16 of the Arabian Nights Entertainments. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Arabian Nights Entertainments by Andrew Lang. Chapter 16 First Voyage. I had inherited considerable wealth from my parents, and being young and foolish, I at first squandered it recklessly upon every kind of pleasure. But presently, finding that riches speedily take to themselves wings if managed as badly as I was managing mine, and remembering also that to be old and poor is misery indeed, I began to bethink me of how I could make the best of what still remained to me. I sold all my household goods by public auction, and joined a company of merchants who traded by sea, embarking with them at Balsora in a ship which we had fitted out between us. We set sail and took our course towards the East Indies by the Persian Gulf, having the coast of Persia upon our left hand, and upon our right the shores of Arabia Felix. I was at first much troubled by the uneasy motion of the vessel, but speedily recovered my health and since that hour have been no more plagued by seasickness. From time to time we landed at various islands, where we sold or exchanged our merchandise. And one day, when the wind dropped suddenly, we found ourselves becalmed close to a small island like a green meadow, which only rose slightly above the surface of the water. Our sails were furled, and the captain gave permission to all who wished to land for a while and amuse themselves. I was among the number, but when, after strolling about for some time, we lighted a fire and sat down to enjoy the repast which we had brought with us, we were startled by a sudden and violent trembling of the island, while at the same moment those left upon the ship set up an outcry bidding us come aboard for our lives, for what we had taken for an island was nothing but the sleeping back of a whale. Those who were nearest to the boat threw themselves into it, others sprang into the sea, but before I could save myself, the whale plunged suddenly into the depths of the ocean, leaving me clinging to a piece of the wood which we had brought to make our fire. Meanwhile a breeze had sprung up, and in the confusion that ensued on board our vessel in hoisting the sails and taking up those who were in the boat and clinging to the sides, no one missed me, and I was left at the mercy of the waves. All that day I floated up and down, now beaten this way, now that, and when night fell I despaired for my life. But weary and spent as I was, I clung to my frail support, and great was my joy when the morning light showed me that I had drifted against an island. The cliffs were high and steep, but luckily for me some tree roots protruded in places, and by their aid I climbed up at last and stretched myself upon the turf at the top, where I lay more dead than alive, till the sun was high in the heavens. By that time I was very hungry, but after some searching I came upon some edible herbs, and a spring of clear water, and much refreshed I set out to explore the island. Presently I reached a great plain where a grazing horse was tethered, and as I stood looking at it I heard voices talking apparently underground. And in a moment a man appeared who asked me how I came upon the island. I told him my adventures, and heard in return that he was one of the grooms of Mirage, the king of the island, and that each year they came to feed their master's horses in this plain. He took me to a cave where his companions were assembled, and when I had eaten of the food they set before me, they bade me think myself fortunate to have come upon them when I did, since they were going back to their master on the morrow, and without their aid... I could certainly never have found my way to the inhabited part of the island. Early the next morning we accordingly set out, and when we reached the capital I was graciously received by the king, to whom I related my adventures, upon which he ordered that I should be cared for and provided with such things as I needed. 
Being a merchant, I sought out men of my own profession, and particularly those who came from foreign countries, as I hoped in this way to hear news from Baghdad and find out some means of returning thither, for the capital was situated upon the seashore and visited by vessels from all parts of the world. In the meantime I heard many curious things and answered many questions concerning my own country, for I talked willingly with all who came to me. Also to while away the time of waiting I explored the little island named Castle, which belonged to King Mirage, and which was supposed to be inhabited by a spirit named De Guile. Indeed, the sailors assured me that often at night the playing of timbrels could be heard upon it. However, I saw nothing strange upon my voyage, saving some fish that were two hundred cubits long, but were fortunately more in dread of us than we were even of them, and fled from us if we did but strike upon a board to frighten them. Other fishes there were, only a cubit long, which had heads like owls. One day after my return, as I went down to the quay, I saw a ship which had just cast anchor and was discharging her cargo, while the merchants to whom it belonged were busily directing the removal of it to their warehouses. Drawing nearer, I presently noticed that my own name was marked upon some of the packages, and after having carefully examined them, I felt sure that they were indeed those which I had put on board our ship at Balsora. I then recognized the captain of the vessel, but as I was certain that he believed me to be dead, I went up to him and asked who owned the packages I was looking at. There was on board my ship, he replied, a merchant of Baghdad named Simbad. One day he and several of my other passengers landed upon what we supposed to be an island, but which was really an enormous whale floating asleep upon the waves. No sooner did it feel upon its back the heat of the fire which had been kindled, than it plunged into the depths of the sea. Several of the people who were upon it perished in the waters, and among others this unlucky Sinbad. This merchandise is his, but I have resolved to dispose of it for the benefit of his family, if I should ever chance to meet them. Captain, I said, I am that Sinbad who you believe to be dead, and these are my possessions. When the captain heard these words, he cried out in amazement, Lack a day! And what is the world coming to? In these days there is not an honest man to be met with. Did I not with my own eyes see Sinbad drown? And now you have the audacity to tell me you are he? I should have taken you to be a just man, and yet for the sake of obtaining that which does not belong to you, you are ready to invent this horrible falsehood. Have patience and do me the favor of hearing my story, said I. Speak then, replied the captain. I am all attention. So I told him of my escape and of the fortunate meeting with the king's grooms, and how kindly had I been received at the palace. Very soon I began to see that I had made some impression upon him, and after the arrival of some of the other merchants, who showed great joy at once more seeing me alive, he declared that he also recognized me. Throwing himself upon my neck, he exclaimed, Heaven be praised that you have escaped from so great a danger. As to your goods, I pray you take them and dispose of them as you please. I thanked him and praised his honesty, begging him to accept several bales of merchandise in token of my gratitude, but he would take nothing. Of the choicest of my goods I prepared a present for King Mirage, who was at first amazed, having known that I had lost my all. However, when I had explained to him how my bales had been miraculously restored to me, he graciously accepted my gifts, and in return gave me many valuable things. I then took leave of him, and exchanging my merchandise for sandal and aloes wood, camphor, nutmegs, cloves, pepper and ginger, I embarked upon the same vessel, and traded so successfully upon our homeward voyage, that I arrived in Balsora with about one hundred thousand sequins. 
My family received me with as much joy as I felt upon seeing them once more. I bought land and slaves, and built a great house in which I resolved to live happily, and in the enjoyment of all the pleasures of life to forget my past sufferings. Here Sinbad paused and commanded the musicians to play again, while the feasting continued until evening. Then the time came for the porter to depart. Sinbad gave him a purse containing one hundred sequins, saying, Take this, Hinbad, and go home, but to-morrow come again and you shall hear more of my adventures. The porter retired quite overcome by so much generosity, and you may imagine that he was well received at home, where his wife and children thanked their lucky stars that he had found such a benefactor. The next day Hinbad, dressed in his best, returned to the voyager's house, and was received with open arms. As soon as all the guests had arrived, the banquet began as before, and when they had feasted long and merrily, Sinbad addressed them thus. My friends, I beg that you will give me your attention while I relate the adventures of my second voyage, which you will find even more astonishing than the first. End of the First Voyage <laughs>